Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite a todos, todas e todos. Eu me chamo Ilha de Castro, eu sou pesquisador mestrando do Pós-UFBA. Estou aqui para saudar a todos nessa segunda sessão. Ufba, and I'm here to, to greet everyone in the second session of the mini course Pandemics and Epidemics Past and Present, the second cycle of life, lives of the school, the doctoral school from the Fabrica de Ideias. What we, we do everything, and this is already in the schedule, the calendar of uh, researchers uh, around the world. And in this session, in this, in this uh, cycle, we have over 30 professors participating all over the world. And we have partnership with the Federal University of uh, Bahia the post, the graduation program in the ethnic studies, anthropology studies from the uh, Bahia uh, Federal University, anthropology of the University of Campinas, um, and uh, with the support of uh, uh, African, Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence, as well as all the team that is part of the Fabrica, I thank you. Thank you very much. We have the support of the University of, uh, of uh, Cabo, Cape Verde, the Dean of Extension of the Federal University of Bahia, the International Association of Graduation, the Brazilian Association of Political Science, the, the Brazilian Society of so uh, Sociology, and is made possible through AGS 9 and graciously translated by the professor Paula Santos. To all involved, to all the team, very, thank you very much. And to all of those who participate actively sharing their time, we say thank. We also would like to remind that it's necessary the presence in the 75% of the course to, to uh, receive the certificate and please you can bring your questions in the chat or in the uh, q a and uh, we are, we want to to see possibilities of real exchanges to thinking this such a complex theme so today we have the presentation of professor zamparoni and uh, the debated by professor Livio Sansoni. So thank you all of you, be welcome. Good morning to everyone. Today, as I have announced, I will have a class. I'm going to show you some uh, some slides, I'm going to use a PowerPoint here. Just a second. Suponho que vocês estejam vendo. I suppose you can see this image. Então hoje nós vamos falar um pouco. Today. There's no. We cannot see the image. That's what we are explaining. Está aparecendo o seu Wind Explorer, que é todo o o chama o Todos os documentos seus. Espera aí, vou okay. fechar tudo aqui. Eu estou só explicando que não podemos ver ainda. Vamos novamente. Vamos tentar de novo. Agora sim, perfeito. Sim, yes, perfeito. Ok? Ok. A janela toda aí, vocês estão vendo, não é? Ok, you, 
you all can see. Today, our team, we are going to talk a little bit about two. I would like to talk about more, but uh, I would like to talk about three, at least three big topics that would be cholera, particularly in the 19th century. That's the, the, the until the beginning of the 20s and the Spanish flu, that's also a pandemic and more specifically there, which would be the, the, the breaks of different passes, the, bov the bovine passes and, uh, and their relationship with the human beings. Uh, maybe we are not able to enter in the third theme. So just remember one very important thing that I didn't talk much last week, last class, that we have to take in consideration that in the African continent, particularly in the African continent, but also present in other places, the idea, the notion that people has of health disease and cure is very different of the one that of the of the notion of biomedicine even around among us or even in europe that supposedly is more developed with a long tradition of western medicine there is a still there is a series of healing practices that are outside of the biomedicine. In the African continent, there is a very clear notion of that, that life does not end with the death. So life would be a, a one part of human existence. So before we were born, we exist as a potence, as a vital energy that existed in the lineage that we belong to. And when we are born, we incarnate this vital energy. And then we, we realize our natural phases that would be birth, growth, maturing, and death. That's a um, natural uh, cycle. Any uh, intercurrence, that we have in this is a, is a manifestation of an immaterial power that interferes either as an activity or a deity or energetic pot potence of certain place or territory or through evils caused by people or by sorcerers, uh, which people, this is not a, a this word is not, uh, is a proper word, not like the colon, colonialists uh, use it. Uh, this is believed. We have to see that witchery is always seen as something bad, which is different from, from healing. So there's a movement of uh, uh, um, persecution to these people who can do this kind of, uh, but the Western literature many times make a confusion between healers and witch doctors. For example, there are healers that have the abilities to manage these powers as well, but they, but they, they do also healings through uh, phytotherapy, you know, the plants, plant-based, that are, plants that are ritualized that needs to receive this energy as well, this vital energy that are in the plants and and needs to be transferred from another metaphysical, spiritual 
power to potentialize the vital energy of these plants. So it's a, a two way. So the plants receive this charge through rituals and words specific. And in the other side, the presence and the use of these plants also potentialize the words, the gestures, the choreography of the sacred. This is not a specificity only uh, from Africa, from in the in the Catholic mass is a ritual that has specific words, specific gestures that are used to result in a powerful thing that is the transubstantiation of uh, the transformation of a piece of bread in the body of the and of the wine and the blood of the son of God, Jesus Christ. And to do that, you have to be a priest, you know, has a, a specific formation. It's like the healer is not, is not, it's not everybody who can be a healer. They also have a long formation. Okay. Uh, so that individual also is consecrated as such. So the word that he speaks carries a magic transformative force the same way that the words of the priest means to the Christians who follows the, the Catholicism. So this, the followers, the, the believers, uh, you know, believe that what the priest says uh, has that power as well as the people who believe that the, the words that the, the healer manages uh, also has the same power. But this universe, when the, when the Western medicine enters in the African territory, then they start to challenge this, this power. And this happens particularly from the 19th century when they with the colonialist occupation of the African territories. Before that, there are reports of uh, travelers or European governors that, that recognize that little differs the practice of healing of the European doctors to the ones uh, in Africa, particularly the herbalist uh, um, so some of these governors from Europe, they admit that they look for treatment with local healers in, in Africa. Also, I want to remind you that we are going to talk about things about the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century but it's possible and that other epidemics existed in the, in the African past. But unfortunately, outside of those of the Islamic universe that uh, left texts of the travelers, we only will have information about this uh, in the African continent uh, from the time that we have writings in the Western languages. If it's, it's true, that's very possible, and but it's not very much studied, but that if we had an attention or uh, a research in depth uh, of uh, uh, travelers, you know, Muslim uh, travelers, who traveled particularly, not very known, but uh, that um, it's possible that they have described uh, costumes or cultural practices in the, in the East Coast of Africa, for example, in its interior. So maybe that's someone that reads antique uh, ancient Arabic language, maybe they can find uh, uh, tips, you know, find, uh, but I can't. So this class, we are going to talk about 
a colonial context, the transition second half of the 19th century until the of 19th century to the uh, until 1920s in the beginning of the 20th century when the presence the european presence converts it itself in in european dominance in the african continent so we are going to talk two epidemics that really affected uh the african continent but not only but one is the cholera uh, and the cholera impacts were major in the 19th century and the famous uh, spanish flu that was a pandemic around 1918 and it uh, it lasted about uh, uh one and a half two years you know was um different from what had happened to the black plague or the bubonic plague that lasted about a century in europe and uh, several recurrences in several places including in europe this image that uh, you can see is an attempt of the colonial Portuguese colonial government of the indigenous hospital Igurue. Igurue is a province in the north of Mozambique. In these uh, mountain regions, there was a very commercial explo exploration of the tea. Uh, plantation and this was very important to the colonial economy from portugal and they tried to build they they, they there was a strong persecution to the healers by the uh, portuguese government so they 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 thought that it was necessary to replace this uh, savage, you know, uh, practice and try to replace this practice by the practice of the Western medicine. So this hospital is already from the 1950s, but I wanna just call your attention. I, I'm not sure if in 1940s, it, it it looks more like a church right at the main building to, of the hospital rem, reminds us of the a church and and this also reminds us with the relationship of biomedicine and colonialism in africa this is one of the moral justifications that colonialists use for the colonial exploitation. So this, so uh, savage barbarians, they they uh, do terrible things for healing. Uh, there is a text about leprosy that talks a lot of um, about this. but they also talk about the indigenous and uh, quotes about this disease. But here is a clear association of the image, uh, the cross of the hospital and the cross of the church. And, uh, and, and the way that the entrance is, you know, with the steps, it looks like a, a, a church, like a, with a, Semi tower in the center, but also I wanna, you, I wanna you to look at the buildings in the side. So that is an attempt of the Portuguese to adapt their presence to see if they if they did an adaptation there would be a major adherence from the natives in relationship to the biomedicine. 
so they have the conclusion that that the natives do not want to be treated in hospital in hospital in in collective uh, uh, rooms so in the hospital they have uh, some procedures rooms here in this main building but the people who were uh, sick they would be you know uh, hospitalized in, in the in the in this round buildings with that kind of ceiling they use they use red uh, uh, tiles but uh, it imitates of course uh, i didn't bring other pictures but uh, in the back we have uh, like a bathroom or in an area to wash clothing but each native would have their own room to be treated individually that was an attempt of the medical service to think that they would be approaching the space of the privacy of uh, uh, that uh, the local people preferred. So the cholera has an origin, a very old, very ancient, that unknown. We know that's present in few texts of the Ayurvedic medicine in the fifth century. Before that, uh, there are no texts or the historians do not mention the existence of this disease with these characteristics. So in the text of the Ayurvedic medicine talks about uh, uh, a disease that provokes an acute deadly diarrhea in the Ganges uh, basin in the fifth century already. So the Portuguese travelers that I showed you in the other class, the route of the commerce. So in the 15th and 16th century, the travelers mentioned uh, Moriti, how uh, is the name of cholera in India. This term has been modified by the pronunciation. The Portuguese wrote Mordexin, Mordechin, and in French, Mordechin, the death of the dog. They, they, they transformed they transformed the, by pronunciation. So for a long time, people in France have known cholera as Mordecai. Cholera can be considered a poor people's disease. The transmission of the bacteria in the format of a vibrion, vibrion uh, is through or a uh, uh, contaminated food by fecal matter. Very rarely it can survive in planktons and transmit through fishes or seafood or, part uh, or, or salted water. Not even in lagoons that are close to the ocean. I'm going to read and you're going to understand why. How are the symptoms of this disease? This is not to impress you, but it's important to understand how this disease enters in the social and the history memory of the people who are affected by them. Once people ingest contaminated water or contaminated food, and it depends on the quantity of bacteria that is ingested. The toxin uh, uh, interferes in the abs absorption of the water and uh, 
the electrolytes that in the, that does the absorption in the intestine. So the first is is there is a a, re, a acute diarrhea diarrhea that is explosive, and that empties the intestine of the fecal. Uh, it causing the dehydration, and the dehydration produces a sensation of prostation and pain and lasted from two to 12 hours. The second stage is the one or two days after it gets vomits, collapses, and dehydration is very fast, and the capillaries are broken and uh, gives a ashy effect in the patient. The skin becomes black and bluish. Uh, the the eyes and the and the faces all in cave. You know the blood pressure falls and there's no more urine. Violent convulsions of the muscles of the of the legs and causes tremendous pain the loss of liquid is so big that the blood becomes so thick that is if you open their vein the blood does not runs out and at this time the patient has lost the major part of the fluid is in the body and suffers extremely with with plain consciousness. And so the death may occur by, by kidney failure. And one person, a healthy person can die in few hours after after the beginning of the second stage. I don't I think this is not pleasant to 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 hear at this early in the morning. So the first big epidemic of cholera happened in 1817. It has started in, uh, in Africa and it went to the Indic uh, Ocean Islands and, uh, and then it affected the Western coast of Africa and then Europe and Americas. The second big epidemic is, was 1920 and 36. And the third, also in the 1960s, three years after the second, and less almost 30 years, over 20, from 1839 and 40 until 61, 1861. This was, was a, a less intense epidemic, but very lasting. The reasons why this epidemic has, has really spread that is different from the plagues, for example, that has to do with conditions, uh, health conditions, you know, particularly the, the researchers points out that uh, is due to the imperialism, particularly the British imperialism, the, the British expansion, colonialism, you know, that's synonym of violence. So the colonial and imperial ex expansion, and the name says the dominance, it based in the war and that that causes displacement of populations destruction of uh, of uh, cultures and agriculture and uh, uh, it brings hunger it brings war and uh, soldiers they moved everywhere so everything contributes to the degradation of the sanitary conditions and added to that the technological innovations, the the ships in the 19th century, they are moved by steam, they're steamboats, and they start also building the railroads. There's an increase of the frequency of the traffic of people. 
and also increases the speed and the, vol the volume of the commerce. So the merchandise can uh, bring uh, contamination. It may be water contaminated or food contaminated, and they can contaminate people along their uh, route. For example, 19th century, the uh, East uh, India Company, they, this, the British Empire has occupied a lot of the, the uh, coast um, of India and, and the interior of India. They really uh, took uh, soldiers from the areas that the British were establishing. So there was their, their implement, they stayed there and from there they expanded and created the colonies, particularly based in the sugarcane plantation, etc. The second focus of the import for diseases is the pilgrimage to the Asian subcontinent for uh, to the sacred places in India and in the African continent and for the and for the Islamic world, the Mecca migrations. For example, in 1846, 15,000 pilgrims died in Mecca in one year of cholera. The survivors returning, they, they brought it to, to Morocco, Morocco, and, and those who returned by water as well, by the Mediterranean water, they brought to Morocco in the Atlantic. The ones who returned by the Red Sea, they brought to the Swahili coast, Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania. And later, they penetrate in the regions of the interior of the continent where there was a very intense commerce through the caravans and has expanded to the Indic Islands, Reunion, Comores, and Madagascar. Um, professor, where you going to move to another slide? So this slide show the routes of the commerce. And these com commercial routes help us to see how the disease is spread. And different from the bubonic plague that is transmitted uh, through the fleas that has as main host the rats who goes into the ships and transmit to humans. Uh, but in the cholera, is more through the contagion of a fecal matter bacteria. So the vector that transmits the disease is through the ship's infected people, particularly through the water, contaminated water. Since we see the, the terrible symptoms, the contaminated person in the second day already has the dramatic effects of the diseases. So very rarely people would leave from Calicut or Goa in India and would arrive, you know, in the coast of uh, Mozambique alive or would leave Mecca and uh, still reach Morocco alive or leave uh, um, health from, from Europe and would uh, reach America alive. That's now how it happened. The majority of the people has a very sudden, a very fast death. Very few people are uh, can be healed. It's a very evident disease. People start with terrible diarrhea, terrible vomits. 
So people thought by doing the isolation of these people, they would be healed. And that was not the truth. But the management of the, the feces in that system of navigation and even the discharge in the ocean only contributes to disseminate. So because recent studies shows that the bacteria can survive for long periods and the colder, the colder the water uh, in, the, in the sea current, they su survive for a long space and for a long time. And we can think that in the 19th century was a common, the discharge of the feces in the river or in the ocean. India and rural Brazil is common people to, to do it in the open, uh, open, not, not having bathrooms. So in, uh, in an open area. So any big rain can bring those residues, the fecal residues to the water and people are to a river, for example and people will be uh, showering in that river or collecting water in that river. So it's a very complicated situation. So we had in the East, the dissemination was happening through the commerce and by the aggressivity, by the violence of the imperialism. And in India, by the uh, British colonies and also for example, they start taking spaces in Japan. They take Zanzibar, they occupy Zanzibar. In Europe, the reunifications, wars, the civilian wars, the biggest ones, Italy and uh, Germany, and also the Crimea uh, war that was French and British against the Russian, it caused uh, thousands of uh, death by cholera in both sides. And people say that just like it happened in the Paraguayan war between Argentina and Brazil against Paraguay, it died in both sides, more people from cholera than in the war itself. These other wars that I mentioned, the, uh, the European wars, what it causes, these unification conflicts, these wars end up bring impoverishment. Peasants are the main victims, the uh, decrease of the production, uh, misery, uh, poverty, extreme poverty. And this accelerates the migration to Americas. We know that the great numbers of uh, European uh, immigrants to America is going to happen from, particularly from 1840s. Hobsbawm has a book about that, the sequence of this revolution and unification movements. So we have a, a impoverishment that is gro is growing and uh, and uh, massive immigration. There are other routes that we don't know very well here in the Western side. That is called pulleys. Uh, that's a generic term for miserable poor from Chinese and India. They are taken by British empire to the um, um, rubber plantation in the Southeast Asia. Another route of migration uh, with millions of people. It happens for the Asia, the Northeast of Asia from China to Manchuria. 
And then in the middle 19th century, a massive migration from Russians to Siberia. All of these are bringing the color of Vibrium. The color from 1860 was so destructive. Not as a strong in Europe as it was in Europe, not as strong in Asia like it was in Europe and America, but the terrible way that the death, you know, happens, it helps to resuscitate in the uh, Western world, the, the Black Plague ghosts, all this context of the 19th century is the height of the scientific racism that considerates that all the other peoples outside of the Europeans, all the others are barbarians or savage. So this movement that associates to the black death, to the minorities that we mentioned in the previous class, this is taken to extremes. Uh, the word that was more used, it was a uh, Chinese disease that would be used as an expression of the bar uh, barbarians and uh, uh, Chinese disease bar barbarian is in our daily life today, talking about COVID, all the Bolsonarians, the Bolsonaro's followers are insisting in this ideology that is a way of racism adjusted to the modernity, to the contemporaneity. But it's also that interesting that the Japanese has its own version. The Japanese are were isolated from the Western world. The Europeans are able to conquer some small harbors of Japan they are hit uh, uh, more uh, later in the 19th century, but they designate the disease as the disease of the uh, Western barbarians. There's always a little bit of ethnocentrism and uh, uh, the Japanese revenge is, is here. So the cholera was brutal and destructive. In 1865, the pilgrimage to Mecca of the 90,000 pilgrims who visited Mecca, 15,000 died right there in Mecca from cholera, not counting the people who died in the return, leaving Mecca. 1866, Uh, Egypt had 50,000 deaths. United States had 50,000 deaths. And the little island that you cannot see in the map, the Guadalupe Island in the Caribbean, that was a very small island, had 12,000. It was one of the highest rates in the Western world. In 1866, the pilgrims, there's an important place of a pilgrimage in India, Hardwar. The mortality rate, it was around 50% of the pilgrims, 125,000 deaths in one year of this pilgrimage in India. And I told you that the Paraguayan war killed more people of cholera than in the war itself. In, from 1848, the, fir, the first outbreak starts uh, 1817, but this is a third wave of the third epidemic already in the middle 
19th century. So it's in this third wave that Africa is more affected. Argelia and Tunisia are affected in 1849. It's interesting that the disease doesn't come from the African migrations, but also from the North Mediterranean world, from France and Italy. Morocco has two big outbreaks, 1861-1865. Egypt has four from 48, 50, 55, and 60. And from Egypt to Sudan, following the Nile River, to Ethiopia, by the Red Sea, by the, the Eastern Count, Somalia, Zanzibar, Mozambique and the Pacific Islands. Brazil is also affected. We have a big epidemic in the harbors of Bahia, Maranhão, Pará, Rio de Janeiro, Santos in Sao Paulo in 1855. And other cities in the countryside, those connected by railroad or by river with these harbors. In 1860, the plague is going to affect this part of the map, the region of Senegambia, Senegal, and Gambia. We already talked about the eastern coast, and it's going to affect the valleys of the Niger River and the Senegal River in this coast. Senegal in 1868. It, it was coincident with a messianic Islamic movement. And the leader of this movement pointed out that uh, disease and the death of important leadership, uh, you know, public people, it was for punishment for their collaboration with the French present in this region. They were present in this region for more than 40 years in some place. In 1869, when I speak about this region, because it starts in Dakar and um, follows the Senegal River and gets to this region of the Gulf of Benin, sometimes goes down to the Niger with the commercial caravans and affects the, the Western coast to Gambia and to what is uh, Guinea-Bissau today and the archipelagos of uh, Cape Verde, for example, uh, due to the traffic of the of the, uh, all of the uh, ships, you know, who had, who stopped it, who docked in this area. The outbreak was one of more little, if there were 5,000 people among Europeans and Europeans in 1869, there were uh, the death of 1,700 people so it meant 34% of, of the popu total population. It's obvious that the majority of the people who died were Africans, not just because the Africans were the majority of the population, but because the Africans uh, lived in more precarious conditions that were close to slavery, if not to real slavery. Although there was not formally, there was no more slavery, but in practice there was still slavery. Let's change to this other side, to Ethiopia. I don't know how long I've been talking. I think I'm just going to be able to talk about cholera today. Ethiopia had outbreaks that started 
in the around the 1830s, 1834, of, and the last great wave of epidemic, it finished in 1906. So recurrently, they had outbreaks, particularly 34, 35, and then 56, and then 85, 86, 87, no, 67, and then 93, and then 12 years, 1906. But what I wanted to see was the recurrence in the the Copta Church, one of the first Christian churches in the world, interprets cholera as a, a divine wrath and promotes processions and rituals, masses to invoke God mercy to this fatality. But it is a strategy that the, the noblesse, the wealthy people, they didn't participate. They ran away to the mountains, to the more uh, empty spaces, you know. The mortality was so high, so high in Ethiopia. Uh, so these outbreaks of uh, 1893 particularly, it was coincident with a great drought. So this drought also, also what we call the, the bovine pest, episiotia. So all these were coincident. The agriculture used the, the bovines as a, an, uh, in, the, in the agriculture. So the coincidence of the cholera in 1893, that was known as the disease of the wind because they believe that came from the Northeast coast. So at the same time, we have the drought, the cholera and the bovine uh, uh, plague that was since 1888, so there's an estimation that one third of the Ethiopian population died from the result of cholera and hunger due to the association of this context. One place that we have to have more attention because there's more documentation is Zanzibar. Here you can see the map of the cholera, how it is spread out, the several circuits and the movements identified. I'm just showing you some slides of how the slave trade has an a very big importance in the transmission of the cholera in the continent. Here is Zanzibar, is an island that today integrates Tanzania. In the Zanzibar, the Islamic world, so the Swahili world is Islamic, in, and it was uh, subordinated to the Oman Caliph, Caliphate. So Oman becomes so... Zanzibar becomes so important that the Oman, uh, or the, the Sultan, uh, moves the capital to Zanzibar due to the intense commerce that the city represented, particularly of ivory to India, slave people to the, to the plantations of, uh, particularly of coconut and cloves, and to the Indic islands that are here. 
and also to part of Madagascar to have uh, an idea the exportation of slaved people from from this coast between Tanzania and Mozambique to to the Indic Ocean that an estimation that a hundred thousand enslaved people were by by the decade no every year you had a hundred thousand people per year in this decade uh, that was uh, 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 trafficked to these territories and this is going to decline when the British increases the pressure over the Zanzibar traders. They come to the prohibition of the trade by uh, enslaved trade, but the not of the slavery. Uh, in 1890, there was about 100,000 uh, enslaved people working the clove plantations in Zanzibar. So the British put pressure to the Sultan to, to abolish slavery, and they do abolish the trade. But uh, only uh, seven years late, the Zanzibar becomes the uh, a British protectorate. So then they abolish formally the slave slavery in Zanzibar and in the coast. But slavery, the trade, were in the hands of people from Zanzibar and Banyarins, that is a caste from this region that um, he's pointing out from, from India and Pakistan. There's a caste and that is a Hinduist of rich merchants. They live from this, tra this trade, the, this slave trade to the, to the islands of Zanzibar. But the British start to introduce the pulleys the Indian police and Chinese. Here we see a slave trade, you know, trafficking enslaved people from the coast. You can see a lot of children involved in this traffic. This is an image, a book from Richard Burton. You know, Richard Burton is a, a a uh, traveler, not the, not the actor. So Zanzibar in the 19th century, seeing from the terrace of the British consulate, you can see is a place that mixes cons European constructions and Islamic and Arabic construction. This is the same city of Zanzibar. The island is called Zanzibar and the city is called Zanzibar. So it's Zanzibar seen from the ocean. These are pictures of Indian people, East Indian people in Mozambique, and we can see uh, variety. The Banyans are more these ones. And these are Chinese images of Chinese crossing from the US and this East Indian police uh, in the Guadalupe Island. The same kind of uh, ships that uh, made the trade of uh, slave trade of the police also to the Chinese to work in the plantations. They work for the plantations and the railroad. So here, disembarking in South Africa, here, here Indian police in the tea plantations. 
being theoretically uh, paid. This is a debate in South Africa showing that in the north, they want to expel the Chinese, but they are welcome in the south to work in the cotton plantations. This is a, a, this, a picture of pulleys uh, for the construction of the railroad in Uganda. And here pulleys work in the sugarcane plantations in South Africa. Here are the rails to transport the wagons of sugarcane after they are, they are cut. These are uh, Indian uh, families. Here more Chinese, more police. These I believe are images from the US. I'm going to close here. You already seen the images of the images of the Chinese and the pulleys. Let's go back a little bit to talk about Zanzibar. There are very interesting details. There's an interesting book of a doctor that was a Scottish. Uh, he was a doctor in between for nine years. 1865-1874. He publishes a book about the cholera in 1876. It's interesting because he's very innovative because uh, uh, besides collecting documents written by the British, he takes the decision of interview in Swahili. He had learned the language of the Swahili he decided to interview all kinds of travelers who came from the countryside to the Zanzibar. It could be African travelers, Swahili travelers, could be Arabic or Western travelers. He interviewed to inform, to get informed about the disease, about the geography. So the moment he is writing, he, he lived the color of 1869 in Zanzibar. So in the moment of his writing, there is a medicine uh, group calling a medical geography that established the, the links between territory, climate, winds, altitudes, and the diseases. So he is very interested in that. It's a very interesting book because Chris is uh, very innovative. Uh, I can, I, uh, it's available to download if you people are interested. He was against, oh, he was openly against the colonial expansion. He, uh, the, the British, you know, uh, colonial expansion, he had a, a particular uh, problem with the with the governor, and uh, he ends up becoming the governor when the sultan loses political power. So the traveler that leaves a lot of important information. There are two books by him: one about the Great Lakes in Africa, and then two volumes about Zanzibar and the coast that I mentioned already, Richard Barton, then mentioned the cholera in 58 and 59 in Uganda. But 1859, when he arrives in this city called Kiyo, Kiyo is an island, but it was an important uh, trade uh, harbor south of Zanzibar. Cholera, he affirms that the year before he arrived, the cholera had killed half of the population of the island. But what is very curious is he does an observation that's very pertinent to the, what we talk about the medicine. He says that he rec recognized that the places 
uh, they treat the 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 uh, people who were ill, you know, you know, wisely. They used the opium and uh, and a drink. They did not uh, cure the the patients, but they uh, give some kind of anesthesia, so they would suffer less. This was a wise practice to to treat, and did not uh, act like the Anglo Indian surgeons that kill the the patients using mercury and other things what is interesting is the description of the city he says when he arrived in 59 1859 the soil and the air seems saturated of poison and the blood seem uh, a predisposition to receive that. People died as flies. Uh, the, the poorest victims were uh, dragged to be uh, thrown in the, in the waters of the basin, in the low tides. People were a little bit in a bad economic situation, they were put in like uh, hammocks and they were thrown on the same deposit as the others. The water looked, you know, oily because it was pointed by fragments of human beings, blacks and browns, you know, partially colored. And they were rotten by the uh, salted water. I can imagine the scene as I said, I can imagine the scene of these rotting bodies in the tide movement. And in 1860, he's talking about Kia Su. But in 1860, seven to 8,000 people died in the suburbs of Zanzibar. The majority in this uh, outbreak, the, once more, the majority was enslaved and poor. Only a few Europeans died and most of them were sailors. Uh, of the that worked in the whales, you know, fishing in 69 and 70. He described it as the epidemic as a non controllable. There were about 25,000 people who died in the island and uh, in the city of Zanzibar, a lot of people. The disease killed more than 10% of the Arabic, six and a half percent of the Indian, East Indian, and at least 25% of the Africans. So this death, Africans were, the population of the island, it was a floating. Sometimes it had 200,000 inhabitants. It was a small island. And sometimes it had twice as many people uh, depending of the commercial trade in the region. These taxes, these rates were the highest rates in the world for cholera. One, excuse me for the interruption. Can we do a 
pause of five minutes to do another uh, exchange of the translator to let me finish a few minutes, you know, the and then we do the, the break. Just to, as a conclusion, Christ was a pioneer to affirm and reaffirm that the contamination of the cholera was by the ingested water and he was against and he was a minority voice of the of people believe that was the was airborne disease so this this thesis of the um, miasmas was very disseminated in the islamic world and this was still in the western world as well until Koch and pasteur identified the bacteria and that we entered the era of but the bacteriology and very slowly bacteriology you know enters because people once they they found the bacteria many doctors did not believe it many doctors still work it based in the thesis of their so the discussion of the Barton says the air is contaminated, the smell of the people dying and of the dead. People are contaminated by this bad air, by this rotten air. And Chris established clearly that's the contaminated water. And it's curious, his book is very interesting. There's a long description he associates the disease to the cultural characteristics and the social conditions that helps to understand how the mortality affects one social group more than the other. Zanzibar, it was, uh, it was many ethnic groups. There was the uh, quartier of the Europeans, the quartier of the Banyans, the quartier of the other Arabic. So the Hindus, Muslim, it was very different in their cultural practices uh, from the Muslim, from the Arabic Peninsula. And the Hindus, although they were from India, but they were not Muslim, they had a different practice and they were impacted in a different way. So Zanzibar, although was a cosmopolitan city in the sense that were African peoples from different origins and Asians from different origins as well. And Europeans from different origins, but the Europeans were a more a homogeneous group and also a minority. There are all these differences of in costumes. I'm going to conclude to talk talking about the Banyanes. He he writes a lot about that. The Europeans who lived in the coast, the whites. Practically nobody died in the big outbreak of 1869 because they had their own source of drinking water, potable water outside of the city. Although they were not, uh, they did not uh, knew about the bacteriology of the Germans, said it was common to these rich Europeans, they filtered the water. But the Europeans in the that were in the ships, they died because the ships were supplied by water in the coast by contaminated sources or contaminated water fountains. And the method was also, uh, but as I said, I'm going to talk about the Banyanis. The Banyanis is a caste in Mozambique is also called like that. It's a caste of merchants. They were the great capitalists, the slave, you know, traffickers. 
from Zanzibar. These rules of the castes imposed uh, a, a, a rigid hygiene isolation. They ate in just in a dischargeable material. They ate in leaves. They ate in uh, contents made out of uh, leaves or, or, or clay that were broken later. So uh, like, for example, I remember that I, I ate a yogurt in a draw clay, I think not, not, not taken to the kiln. But they were, you know, they just were broken. People ate the, uh, the, that food, break, so that it cannot be reused. Aside of that, this rule of caste that the water had to be taken of their own wells by the member of their own caste. If it did not happen, they would be impure. They would be contaminated. The the Benianis, they they brought their own water when they traveled. So when when they uh, went from one place to the other, was not the water from the boat or the ship that they drank. They took they brought their own water and they only drank from their own water. And also the Banianis had the the costume of uh, wash the clothing and their and the bodies every day he says they spend half an hour daily cleaning their 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 teeth and their tongue and they would have a bowel movement twice a day daily so Chris, to conclude, mentioned another variant of Muslim that were present in that city that's different from the ones from the Arabic Peninsula, which is the Kojas. In Mozambique, we have a lot of Kojas. They are followers of Ismail comes from the northern region of uh, India, where today is um, Pakistan. And this group, although they are Muslim, they have an extraordinary care about diseases. But he says in, in some way, all the Muslim people follow the hygiene uh, prescribed by the Quran in different ways. What did not happen with the African people, because the majority was under slavery, and they had to go, you know, they had no access to to uh, bathrooms or anything. It due to their social condition, they would, their feces were in open air, was in open sewage, let's say. Christie was an abolitionist, and therefore he describes the situation. I'm going to conclude. I'm going to read another. Uh, when we come back from the break, we talk about something else. The dolls, these boats were uh, full, you know, one on the top of the other of enslaved people. So some were with the collar, some were in the death stage. So, uh, many uh, in this 
in this way, not having water or food in this crossing. They were disembarked in the uh, costumes of uh, Zanzibar. In this place, not just the dead, but the ones dying were thrown to the ocean. And not just the one, the dying one, but those who were so weak that it was not worth the payment of one dollar. But for each enslaved person coming from the coast of Africa to Zanzibar, uh, uh, he he did the conversion, but it was not the American dollar, but it was paid uh, one dollar that they were using there for each enslaved person who disembarked in Zanzibar. So this very, very weak, very skinny. Where, uh, so they were disembarked naked. They were in Kiwa. There were about 200 enslaved people dying per day and they they had no use for them so the merchants uh offered in this condition a dozen of them for 50 shillings where before they were almost 50 shillings each so thousands of death are reported by missionaries from the villages in the countryside. And to conclude, he talks about of how the cholera goes to the interior of Mozambique and affects the north or the south coast of Mozambique. It goes as far as in the Bilagoa Bay. About the cholera in Mozambique, there are just a few. We don't have uh, a lot of documentation. Uh, I was reading about the, the uh, documents about health, but uh, there are very few, few mentions that very fragmented. I don't know how long I have spoken or read, but we are going to do a break. I believe I, I spoke more than an hour. So I think uh, if we want, when we come back from the break, we start the debate. What do you think? And then I just talk about the other as a answer. We are going to stop for five minutes and in the return, you can dialogue with the questions. We have another hour of the activity. So let's do the break. We return in five minutes, 11.38.
Olá, olá a todos. Bem-vindes, bem-vindas, bem-vindos de volta. Vamos só aguardar o professor Zamparoni retornar para que possamos retomar essa segunda, esse segundo curso do, do mini curso Pandemias e Epidemias, alguns casos africanos. Lá, desculpe, eu um dia do atraso, me distraí aqui. Tranquilo, professor. Eu só vou pedir um instante para, é, enquanto a nossa equipe técnica adequa a Raquel à função de intérprete, que a gente fez uma pequena troca. Good afternoon. I'm here. Estou aqui. Já para te concluir, eu faço... Tem alguém falando muito baixo que eu não estou te ouvindo. Pronto, a Raquel. A Raquel já está como intérprete. Podemos é o Lívio retomar. que está falando baixo, que eu não estou ouvindo. Você está ouvindo agora, Zampa? Dá o que ouvir? melhorou, hein, Raquel? Sumiu. Então, William, eu não sei se Zampa quer continuar, eu faço depois um pequeno comentário e abrimos para as perguntas. Pronto, eu posso aí, falar é... rapidamente? É... Tranquilo. Da influenza. So I'm going to speak quickly about influenza. Please. But at any rate, I'm going to speak for 15 minutes and then you stop me so that we can have time for debate. Influenza, which, which is known here as Gripe Espanhola, Spanish flu. And the newspapers, Spanish newspapers, were not being censored. So in Mozambique, it's called Espanola. Hence, though there's not many writings about it in Mozambique, so it's basically they skip ahead and they, they, there's no studies about the Spanish flu in uh, these colonies and medicine congresses in Western Africa that would include people from several places simply do not bring one or two words about the Spanish flu in Western Africa, a Congress that was organized in 1923. And this is a conclusion of historiographers. And between 1918 and 1920, the estimates were that between 30, and 50 million people died all over the world, which is a very high number. But curiously, historiography states that this epidemic, this pandemic rather, did not become part of the meta narrative of, of the world or national histories in the same sense that wars and other epidemics became part of the narrative. And for example, the pest influenced the, the Western European notions about death, the imaginary about death, the notion of the representing death and ritualizing death, but more than the pandemics that killed would be equivalent of the black plague that happened. The influenza epidemic happened a hundred years ago. At any rate, it is interesting because the estimates are very imprecise, like in many of these epidemics, for several reasons. First, 
book published about the epidemic talked about uh, 21 million people dead. It's more than double. Same thing with in Africa or in India. The estimates were in recent studies about 20 million people. In Africa as well, the estimates were a million and 300 and two, two million and a half dead people. But why this imprecision, imprecision, the death, the speed of death, the epidemics coincide with the First World War. So then it comes but the epidemic that develops parallel to war is not a part of this imaginary. It's very interesting. The speed, the coincidence, medical services that would comprise the, the provide the reports and the statistics that were involved with subjects of war and in terms of the in Portugal and the British in particular were very involved and the death the speed of death and there's people here uh, differently from what Mussolini states, we did not have, our statistics are underestimated because the number of people who died by COVID is a lot higher than what was reported because uh, the physicians were not sure about the death cause in order to detect the causes and it stated that it was a acute respiratory syndrome. So this statistic is a curious because for Europeans, we also need to relate with the African continent because let's remind ourselves that Europeans come from Africa to Africa. They come to Africa, they perceive it as a space of, 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 of sickness, of diseases and filth. And then yellow fever, uh, smallpox and venereal diseases. And Europeans also go to Africa uh, six space and in Africa many people die in accelerated rates due to malaria and yellow fever and in this context we have the marks of colonial strength and medicine becomes the one that is going to attenuate the suffering of Africans. It is a mission. And this is exactly what they state, it's a mission. As much as the religious workers that attenuate the suffering of Africans that live in the darkness in a, a far away from God, physicians take upon themselves, it's very interesting in the literature how these physicians in the beginning of the 20th century, they always attribute to themselves this fundamental role of taking civilization to generate a better future for African generations that suffer with diseases. And of course, there was this disease was almost all of them built and organized missions in the interior and so that because the, the people in the interior were less contaminated by 
luxury by drinking and the notion was that there was this notion of purity. The natives in the interior, then, and then this, this Protestant mission were sent to the interior rather than in the oceanic areas. And they also create a, as we state, um, medical care. Many missionaries were trained as nurses or even some physicians. And these women so this is an article that is very interesting uh, by written by Terry Evangel who states that in the literature at that time in the 18th century administrators and missionaries took advantage of the influence uh, spread in order to prove uh, the benevolence of Christians, but the native quickly distrusted both things because the preaching was not enough. And it was because physicians, there are many narratives that French and English doctors, they simply did not know how to deal with this situation. First, they misunderstood cold with influenza or with a pneumonic manifestation of the black plague that attacks the lung and they didn't believe in that so africans also didn't see any efficacy but as i wrote about leprosy, the thing that scared Africans the most was the notion of being isolated. In todos os contextos coloniais, era construir eh, aquilo que popularmente era um lazarete. What to build what was actually part of the isolation processes for quarantine. So Africans ran away from that. And they used many strategies from running away from Western medicine. In fact, I believe that influenza was the first moment in which Western medicine, after with notions of vaccination, in contemporary medicine, it was the first time in which medicine was placed at risk. The notion of the superiority of medicine, Western medicine, and some physicians don't necessarily state that, but they recognize that they have no uh, power to attack this disease because there were was no efficient prevention or adequate treatment. And therefore, recognizing these factors or for unknowing as part of the medicine and treatment, non-treatment from the part of medicine or the medical sciences, I've been reading about them wouldn't prevent them as it was the case for all other diseases from the disease because of high death rates. Rarely, they would not admit to medical incapabilities and rarely they admitted that they were not capable. Through efficient means for of treatment. In the historiography that deals with this issue, one that focuses on the expansion and the 
speed I've been dealing with it, the speed of the spread of the disease. We also need to pay attention to what um, in something else that does that situating that are situating the pandemic in a historical social context, identifying answers and the impact. It is a more refined social history because these explanations end up hiding a notion that when you deal with pandemics, that has hit everybody equally, you end up for voluntarily hiding that there is an answer that is de uma pandemia, ela é bastante diferente, tá certo? Por exemplo, é, 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 the impact, impact of a pandemic is very different in the impact in Europe was like five people per thousand. But in Africa, it was about 15 uh, to 17 people per thousand, three times higher, at least, in any part of the world. It did not affect in the same way. In, in this moment in Brazil, they also talked about that COVID was a democratic disease because it doesn't matter how rich you are, you cannot escape from it. That's not truth. Every uh, disease, you know, uh, affects the, uh, the variance of uh, class, age, etc. But the differences of uh, social class, wealth, access of uh, health services, it's very clear that the, the rates of COVID show clearly the higher rate are among poor people and in Brazil, black people, uh, poor black people. And uh, the professions, the trash collectors, the people who are in conditions of uh, health conditions, worse health conditions, they have to wait for the public service, many times die, wait for the regulation, transference to a better hospital, and die in the intensive care unit line. We are seeing that this, this quotation that the disease affects all of them, because they keep saying about the speed, the high mortality, but does not uh, uh, detail, you know, how it affects everybody. But there are different uh, answers according to the religion, to the social class. Like Christy observed in relationship to the cholera in Zanzibar, the ways of uh, relating to water and to the body. In South Africa, where there are several studies about the pandemics, the Afrikanders, Afrikanders, the whites of Dutch origin, who that supposedly are in the land chosen for God to them. They interpret the pandemic as a wrath of God, anger of God to punish the religious and moral sins. Uh, greed, arrogance, prostitution, um, and curiously, even the adoration to the science as uh, God is angry because people are closer to the science and, lay, and, and uh, far from the faith. This search is also going to happen in the among the Africans, the Anglican Church, particularly the Anglican way of the Christianity was practiced by English in South Africa, richer than the Afrikaners in the majority of the time. 
they can admit sometimes a few moments that is the wrath of God. But God used the pandemic to call the attention of the human beings about their, uh, their mistakes, about their material things and not the majority of the texts is published by Anglicans in South Africa. God called the attention to, of the human failures in the social conditions, failure in to regulate better the, the townships. I'm just 10 minutes. Okay. failure and to create continuation of uh, uh, supply, and, you know, um, uh, or better conditions for everybody. So uh, the natives that I'm calling uh, in, in, like in quote, many people used to say that influenza was a disease of the whites. That was another mechanism of oppression that the whites were managing to attack. And this is curious that this explanation uh, comes back when we talk about AIDS and COVID. That also, uh, both the uh, Spanish flu was also sent by God or would be effect of uh, witchcraft that in the time was very common. I think in South Africa and Rhodesia also, and also in Mozambique there, there are local cultures there are eradicating the witchcraft to attack the the witches to, to attack the sorcerers to, uh, from this movement. There are other movements called Millenarista that revive restoration of a past without the suffering, without the whites. These movements are created as a symptom of the uh, this routine, you know, what the, provoked by the colonialism, by the displacement provoked by the colonialism, by the several disease. As I mentioned, the bovine disease, there are two or three associated. One is tuberculosis and one equivalent, uh, the, 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 the that kills a lot of uh, millions of, uh, of, um, of the cattle in the Kosa uh, society. And, uh, and the cattle is not just one animal for supplying milk. It has a, a lot of uh, a, a, um, relationship with the uh, cultural relationship with the ancestors, uh, weddings, you know, the cattle is present in everything. So the response of this, this, uh, the bovine, this bovine disease, you know, uh, is going to, to, bring more impoverishment to the, the, the population. He mentioned also the foot and mouth disease. And so there is a religious leader who sees the answer. We have uh, three and maybe others. We have the Hindus, the Muslim, the Jewish, all of them. Tend, uh, tend to explain that is divine uh, influence, each one in their own way. I, 
I was going to summarize three different interpretations based in a faith. One in the South Africa, mainly the Austria, Africa, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and a faith in the Western medicine that could not be efficient as already mentioned before, was not uh, efficacy, there was no efficacy. Second, trusted spiritual rituals and planned medicine through the healers, despite the failures that also it demonstrated to, to stop the pandemic. The third interpretation, it was developed from the failures of these two previous answers, not the Christian faith, uh, not the Western medicine, and not the healers, the local healers, would really were able to confront the disease. So there was a strong movement in the, particularly in the Austro Africa. Is, is because they are skeptical about these systems that I'm, uh, I'm mentioning. Uh, they collect faith in God. They are a local reading of the Christi Christianity. They are local. They are they are a church that uh, called Revival Church. Revival Church that. They are going, they say, is going to be a moment that we're going to have to destroy. We have to, we have to build a new one. Is they are anti-medicine. They gave origin to several churches. One of them, among them, some churches. The Zionist churches that are particularly for spiritual cure. See here is an example of a spiritual Zionist leader. This is very common to see in Mozambique in the morning dressed with this cape. The symbols are crosses and stars, and they do healing rituals, particularly in the ocean. This was very strong in this area, this region, in some cases were persecuted. That's another impact. I'm going to talk about another impact in another region in South Africa. In South Africa, the great majority are South Africans are black, And it's, it's very, the impact is, is bigger among the miners, the gold and diamond mines, and also copper in, uh, in all African continent, but particularly in the uh, current Congo, Rhodesia, and particularly in South Africa, close to Johannesburg. The working conditions. This is an image of the 1960s. They are the conditions they are working very deep. They are uh, wa warmer and warmer, dripping water. You can see in the left a pipeline that brings water to the left, close to the floor. So the humidity is high, the temperature is high. There's, there's not always a good ventilation in the South Africa. The first time I, I visited South Africa, I arrived in July. It was snowing. It was in August, it had snow in Johannesburg. So the temperature 
uh, from winter and summer is 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 a, so they they come back from this from these depths that they are sweating and they come up you know uh, to the to the to the cold winter so they are they are uh, housed in this uh, place that they call compound see so their their the conditions that they had the conditions that they had to do everything wash their clothing take their shower so the mortality is very high here you see colonial propaganda about infirmary this is the main hospital of lorenzo marques the capital of mozambique these are pictures of the 1950s of the good treatment that theoretically the the colonialists would give to to the africans to the black here we see what we have indigenous mix it and this this is the uh see here they are she is talking the poor neighborhoods neighborhoods she is like uh, uh preaching you know that this these health agents would go there for the use of the biomedicine. In denounce, you see the objects that are on the floor that were practices of uh, witchcraft. See the an indigenous nurse uh, applying the vaccination and other alternative practices. The healing woman is in trance both in Zavala, Mozambique. So uh, here, healer in Maputo, rendering his services. There was always alternative medicine. This is a propaganda book. In the, that's in the bottom, it says there are two kinds of uh, healer. And this hand full of blisters and thing is is like a, a result of the work of the healers. It's a, a great open campaign against the practice of the healers or the local doctors. And this is done from the Portuguese colonialism. This was a, a very uh, open battle of persecution. I'm going to conclude, so we have a little time for conversation. So we open for the debate now. I'm going to close my screen. Thank you, Professor Zampa for this very good presentation. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Livio to be a little bit more synthetic so we can have some of the questions that are in the chat. I'm very synthetic. I learned a lot. The maximum I can talk few points. It's not a class that I can dis disagrees that are very interesting evidences of the factors of the pandemic that are very, very updated. Col colonialism, pilgrimage, wars, routes and commerce. And today our globalization, all factors of the globalization are factors of the pandemic. One of the questions, uh, the water, uh, the waters that are brought in the for the weight in the ship they brought every everything they brought the disease they they uh, the only the only difference that we have um the 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 ballast water you know uh on the ship you know they brought all sorts of the disease 
He's breaking to me. I think that is, uh, I think that very important he mentioned was a very uh, close connection because uh, social thought, social uh, medical thoughts, geographic uh, uh, thought, and, and this almost is we cannot separate the center of the production of the thought, medical, social, racial, and geographical are the same. And the peripheries where, uh, where the victim is, I don't want to say that the, the uh, peripheries don't produce the knowledge in this sense, but all of this happen in the context are in the colonial context. Uh, it happens down uh, both thing uh, white man, man's bird burden white man's grave uh, they are uh, uh, the tropics are medicalized they are punished for being tropics even in the transition from the from the my, miasmas to the fluids or from the air, we still have the maintenance of the victimization of the tropics as the ideal place for this to, to proliferate. So it's interesting how the geography is used. Cavalli's forces. In the conference of, Be of, of Berlin, talk about uh, about it. The uh, the other is interesting how the periphery react to to this. There is a knowledge that of a doctor social uh, ratio is produced in the peripheries, and it can be the periphery of Bahia, the periphery of. Zanzibar, the periphery of, uh, for, us, for us, because we are located in Bahia, we can, we can think as Bahia as a place of production of the knowledge. But the tropics were always uh, badly associated with the process with the progress as progress and tropic could not be together. We had to re-signify uh, this. Uh, in the, in the, the Dutch empire, uh, it happens as well the same way, although they didn't like to say the Dutch Empire. The case of Zanzibar is fascinating. Uh, I saw something about the colonial hospitals. It looked like to be a big, a huge thing in the center of the city of Zanzibar, where the difference between biomedicine, uh, traditional medicine, family, individual, And merchants, we we have the myth of the racial democracy. The Zanzibar has the myth of the best best uh, uh, merchants in the way in the world. So in the hospital, there are a lot of uh, is a great opportunity for for trading. You know, the the the. The, the sick person participate in the medicine and becomes part of this commerce. The, the hospital that Zamparoni showed, like in the center, looked like a shirt, uh, a church, and then a round hut. That uh, would be, uh, could be, that, uh, that could be, uh, recreate in a more creative way that the families could assist. Uh, the, in all this reflection, there are interesting ideas. 
Zanzibar is the central place for all of that. Is a place of encounter between the West, Eastern and Western about the Islam. And it is a place also of the building of the racist uh, thought, constant, uh, constant relationship about uh, space disease to belong to Africa, to belong to the India world, be African, be Omanic. I think how the peripheries are important in their intricate ways they can shed light as centers. Uh, particularly this new pandemic that we are living and others will come, how the, it shows how the pandemic since the bubonic plague They were always producers of great fears, accusations, but also utopia. Uh, uh, they, they, they become um, reasons for for the geo the new geopolitics in the world. You know that will become centers for migration, centers for no migration. I think that this is going to to affect us more and more. So how the periphery is affected by the coloniality, but also the same trying to, trying to uh, respond to that. If you wanna, uh, if you wanna put them together. Alessandra Barros, she says, I would like to know the, the role uh, of uh, the ritual uh, washes it would uh, uh, have uh, contributed more to the, to the contamination of the pilgrimage the rituals, you know, washes in the, I'm not sure, I don't have any information if the ebullition water could contaminate. But the question, if you have an only container, when the people put their hands with uh, any kind of container to wash their faces, wash their, uh, and this, container goes back with the hand with the other, another person. If that, uh, if that hand has not been, let's say, well washed, of course it can contaminate it. The contamination does not happen by the contact with the contaminated water, the skin or the feet, the water has to be ingested has to be drank. The problem is to contaminate a water that then put the hands in this water and then takes the food with their hands. We have, we have to know that the cultural practice is still today in the African continent, but it was in the Europe also before the 18th century. It, people use the hands to take the food to their mouth without an intermediary object, without silverware of any kind. So in, it, this is where the contamination can happen it, because it's by the ingestion of the food or the drink. The same thing you refer to the ships. It's very pro possible that the ships would have people contaminated that that contaminated the ballast water that uh, will discharge this water in the coast that contaminates that water the fish that the fishermen are going to, are going to uh, uh, catch if they are uh, uh, many times the 
these fish are not cooked, does not reach the temperature to kill the contamination, and people eat that fish or take that wet hand to the to their mouth, and it's possible for them to be contaminated, but it's not uh, uh, direct contamination by by the cholera. Uh, if you just walk in in a contaminated water, you know, that's the uh, Bongeli, who the Bongeli that the Vibrio, uh, who was studying about how the pandemic, pandemic affects the life of a person in terms of intellectual. He's asking for me. He's saying it's not a crystal, it's not a creature. He's saying it's Christy. Uh, Bungeli also mentioned, uh, wants the, the work of Uzinga. So, so if you want to send me an email, Zampa and, uh, uh, at Gmail. If you can send the link, um, he can send the link of the Google Drive. Sindinoma Nita, she's uh, writing from the Burkina Faso and she's saying that the Catholic Church has exactly the same interpretation of the pandemic as punishment of God call for repentance, and she says that any other interpretations do not prosper. I agree, Is I, it depends on the power of the, that the church has, Catholic or other churches, in the social uh, uh, environment that this happens, in all the pandemics, all, it depends a lot. In the case of the Ethiopia, the power of the church was very strong during the pandemic. Uh, it, he put the email in the in the chat, vzampa at gmail.com. So in uh, Ethiopia was very strong, so it had a great uh, in fact, the the Boers newspapers, according to the literature, uh, show that they published prayers and and not not prayers but texts that were, you know, appealing to the faith and to the religion. And also asks, where do we place traditional knowledge? vis-a-vis -vis all these proposed solutions to curb the different pandemics. This is a cultural question, very important one. We don't have a, a one only answer. The way that the knowledges are put, like in the case of the COVID, there was very strong this idea in Nigeria, very strong in Madagascar, very strong in Tanzania, the idea of a local cure with medications produced. Uh, the Madagascar could make a uh, a medicine that would be the solution. And he distributed in several African countries. And this was institutionalized in, uh, but there are traditional knowledges in all the diseases that I mentioned. Is the notion of disease and cure. And if people have believed that cure depends of a spiritual, work is probable that uh, she feels cured when she receives the spiritual comfort. 
if we're going to do um, materialistic reading of the Western medicine, people still will die because they believe it in the faith or because they believe it in a, a healer that use plants. who use rituals, etc. But at least people who look for the faith, that decide for this path, they believe that may help them and helps. We know that even the Western medicine now believes that the predisposition of the, the sick person for the cure is a path to the healing. The way that the sick person gets energy that he receives or she receives from a metaphysical, supernatural, spiritual, so not supernatural, spiritual uh, entity helps him or her to confront the disease. And when that's not possible, the healing, the majority, most of the time, he doesn't blame the faith, but also not the practice of the sacred, but his low faith, let's say, his, his own low faith. This applies to the, to the medicine. Western people who are created in the universe of the materialism, of the biomedicine, we also put our faith in the medicine. But uh, a lot of us who put our lives in the hands of the doctors, we don't survive. So in the Brazilian case, almost 500,000 people died. And the uh, immense majority may have looked for spiritual forms of treatment, but also went you know, by the Mayo medicine and they did not survive but they had faith in the survive. This is an answer that is not excludent. I, I, uh, the knowledge, I don't like to call traditional knowledge and I don't think that is uh, the, when we say traditional, we think that is unchangeable and all that we see in this practice and they are not unchangeable. They incorporated other practices, other values, even from the Western medicine. I think one of the things that I like to remind you that the association of the so-called uh, traditional doctors of Mozambique called Ametrano, this association is called Ametrano. They look for in the beginning of the COVID pandemic they went to a group created by the health ministry from Mozambique, consultants on how to confront the disease. And they recognize in the, before this group, they want advice because they, they thought that the COVID was a disease that for what the, the spirits did not have uh, how to confront. They were unknown to the spirits. They had ways to call, to call for the spirits for the disease that they knew, but in this case, they didn't know. So they were asking for help from the, for example, I found cases of policemen, of policemen who apprehend objects of the healers in the in the persecution to the healers. And within them, there were pharmaceutical or objects of the biomedicine. I believe that these universes are not excluding they, each other. They, it depends on the relationship of individuals with them. Faith is an element that us as a social scientist we, we must consider because this is an element that's part of the existence of the people that lead them to take certain decisions. Danilo has asked, 
Ângelo, Ângelo, the black plague different from the the Spanish flu did not affect the Austro. No, I'm, he is uh, he is disagreeing. He is answering that the black plague yes affected, and the bubonic plague becomes recurrent. There's documentation of the recurrence of the bubonic plague of uh, the bu bubonic plague in Mozambique, even in the second, in the 20th century. We don't have enough documents of the impact of the bubonic plague in Mozambique in the 15th century, for example. But there are references to the existence of the bubonic plague along several centuries, particularly by uh, Portuguese travelers and in the 20th century, in colonial documents, the cholera, the bubonic plague. From 95, almost as an African disease. It may be extinct in other places, but uh, there uh, it's a, a practically extinct in other places. Is only in practically only in Africa. We don't have, in fact, great studies of the medicine or the practices of uh, cure in the African continent, except in few places in the Western Africa, like something in Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa. But we don't have a historiography of the social history and less a historiography that is able to incorporate the, include the local answers to this disease. There's an effort from the from 1990s that start to see this. I think Terence Ranger was a pioneer in this, trying to look for local answers. We can do oral history. For example, now the history of AIDS, Ebola, or COVID, it's possible to do collection of oral information, but the older ones we don't have. And we can see this in the social memory. There is a study of Eschenberg in Senegal, shows that's curious. In Senegal, there's no memory. There is no memory about the influence. He says that almost there's no document. There is no documentation, almost none in the archives. And the social memory in Senegal doesn't speak about influenza. Influenza killed more than the, uh, the, the plague in Senegal. And that happens in Kenya as well, because in Kenya, the influenza has, has uh, was coincident with a great drought. So the social memory of the people is the drought and not the disease. It's interesting, he does, a uh, study that shows that in Senegal, influenza, people remember the plague, even if, even if the, the plague killed, uh, uh, so they remember the plague, the Black Plague, even though it killed only 10% of what the influenza has killed. 
Uh, it says that in Senegal, uh, in Senegal, the it was the influenza, the flu was not the Spanish flu, was the Brazilian flu. When the the influenza or the Spanish flu, there was thousands of Brazilians that was in the harbor, 1,380 Brazilians that were in the harbor of uh, Dakar. Only, only a few of them, less than 30 of them were not contaminated. So the Senegalese, É, com esse título, né? a gripe brasileira. Né? É, e ele diz, portanto, a, me a memória social, em outros lugares, a influenza tem uma memória, é, como eu disse. Influenza has a memory, a social memory. Espanhola. Espanhola. In the big... Espanhola. And in other places as well, but in Kenya, and above all in Senegal, it is not a mark because among other things, it has coincided with other events like the first world war, war. And they were very much involved with the first world war. Thank you, Professor. We went beyond our time, but it has been rich. Rogério Vidal has commented that the Portuguese and the in the west of, of, of Bahia has to do with this hygienic notion and investigating practices of healing and our discourses of uh, the power of healing and the biomedical I don't think that it has to do with this territory. It has to do with Bahia as a whole because it is a practice, intergenerational, intergenerational practice. And I would like to thank you all, IGS-9, Professor Livio, Professor Raquel and Paulia for the translation. And I also would like to thank in particular Professor Zamparano for his brilliant explanation. He will be back next week, Tuesday at 10 a.m. for BRT, our third meeting, so that we can conclude this course and follow up in the last week of the Fabrica in the second cycle of life. Next week, I'm going to, I would like to invite you for the contemporary epidemic analysis, and we are going to talk about uh, Ebola and a locally that we may consider it an epidemic in what has been as part of the local social memory. And we will talk about two pandemics, HIV AIDS and how we are dealing in terms of the impact it's been having, particularly the COVID in contemporary days. We would like to thank you for your attention. But we'll be back on Tuesday. That's it. Thank you so much. We have a great weekend and good Thursday. And see you next week. Thank you.